Good afternoon, everybody. Hello, friends. Thank you so much uh, for taking part of your afternoon out to visit with me. Uh, we're here, as they mentioned, to talk about REITs, ETFs, and the new normal. Trying to find value in REITs today and ETFs as we deal with coronavirus. Uh, I'm coming to you from Dallas, Texas, and uh, I hope everybody is safe out there and sending best wishes and positive vibes. So let's talk about REITs. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, you are exposed to REITs pretty much every single day of your life, wherever you go, and we'll get more into it, but it's a very simple business model. REITs lease space and collect rents on the real estate, and the revenues and income that they generate, they pay out, they turn around and pay out to shareholders in the form of dividends. As you can see here, REITs have to pay out at least 90% of the taxable income to their shareholders. Most will turn around and pay 100% out, but in turn, the shareholders will pay income tax on dividends. So thus management teams and uh, have a lot of their uh, investments staked into the company. They put their own skin in the game, again, because they are being paid dividends on a lot of these investments. So they're looking out in shareholders' interests. Why are REITs so, so important? Uh, they have a great competitive total returns. They have high steady dividend income and a long-term capital appreciation. Before the COVID pandemic, if you go back historically, REITs have had a low correlation with other asset classes. Traditionally, as technology or a lot of the uh, market does well, REITs would sell off, and then times of safety and flights to quality, REITs would outperform. So they are a good portfolio diversifier that helps reduce risk and increase overall returns. If you look at performance overall here, this is as of uh, June of 2019 from NARI, the National Association of Real Estate Investment Trusts. You'll see the first line is the FTSE NARI All Equity REIT Index. 1, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 40 year outperformance, the boxes that are shaded in gray versus a lot of the other major indices that are out there. So consistently beating a lot of the other benchmarks over long periods of time. For a company to qualify as a REIT, it's necessary for them to invest at least 75% of their assets in total uh, real estate. As we mentioned, it has to pay 90% of that taxable income to the former shareholder dividends. And then 75% of the income that they generate has to be from the rents on the property, interest on mortgage, financing, real property, or from the sale of real estate that they own. In addition, it has to be taxable as a corporation. There has to be a board of directors and trustees, a minimum of 100 shareholders, <clears throat> and no more than 50% of its shares are held by five or fewer individuals. Note that we're gonna be focusing here on publicly traded equity REITs. You've also got your private REITs, mortgage REITs, um, non-qualified REITs, but for this purpose, for this presentation, we're just going to cover all the publicly traded companies that are out there on the equity side. So numbers to digest from NAREIT. Uh, again, these are 2019 numbers. If you look, REITs own 520,000 properties across the United States. Over 87 million Americans own REITs in their retirement accounts. Um, there is 2.3 million jobs devoted from REITs in 2017. And uh, if you look at the amount of taxes that were paid, $19 billion in property taxes paid in 2017. In addition, more of what, this is back again from last year, $1.3 trillion equity market cap. There are 31 REITs in the S&P 500. We'll talk more about that shortly. Uh, there's 219 in the FTSE All REIT Index. In total, REITs own approximately $3 trillion of assets of those public REITs own $2 trillion. So a massive amount. Like I said, you can't go from point A to point B without running into REITs. And here's just some more numbers. As they say, uh, if you talk to a typical financial advisor, usual average is anywhere from 5 to 15% of your portfolio should be allocated in REITs uh, because of the high dividends and safety of the income there. There are multiple sectors, and we're going to talk about those here right in a second. Looking at some of the benefits of REIT investments, as we talked about, since we're focusing on the publicly traded equity REITs, they are very liquid. Uh, some of these, you know, they're never going to trade like Microsoft or Intel, the you know, hundreds of millions of shares a day. But you can get two-sided publicly traded quotes on uh, the public stock exchanges. Uh, diversification for the various property types that they are encompassing. Transparency, they do report quarterly dividends, uh, and they're very forthcoming with their uh, reporting. Uh, dividends, as we just discussed, and performance as we've analyzed. So there's clearly a lot of uh, wisdom investing in the REIT sector. As we mentioned here, there's equity REITs, mortgage REITs, the non-listed public REITs, and then the private REITs. Be careful, I caveat, you know, if you are invested in private REITs or non-traded REITs, do your due diligence. 
There's a lot of rules and regulations when it comes to some of these non-traded REITs as far as cash out, uh, yield conversion upon uh, going to public. And so uh, most people follow equity REITs and that's why we're focusing on this here. There's a variety of sectors. So let's just take a look at this. When I mentioned from point A to point B, picture going from your house to go to the mall or something like that, and all the different properties that you're gonna pass, including office buildings, apartments, industrial warehouses, the malls, data centers, cell towers, self-storage properties, student housing, the dorms on college campuses, hotels, a lot of the healthcare companies, hospitals, medical office buildings, the timber, the trees, infrastructure, prison, diversified, that's the guys that own mixed use or different types of properties, uh, casino REITs, farmland, uh, there's, just, there's just so many that are out there. REITs were enacted in 1960. This is a timeline of the various listings of the various sectors that came live. So it's a constant revolution, and we're going to continue to see this evolution of the industry as we move through the 20s into the future. Uh, thanks to our friends at Hoya Capital, I just wanted to give some data points here. This was 2009 performance, 2019 performance, just taking a look at it. Last year, manufacturer housing, the manufacturer homes were up 49%. Uh, the largest companies are Equity Lifestyles, ELS, Sun Communities, SUI, and UMH Properties, ticker UMH. Those are the major manufacturer housing players. Industrial REITs, we'll talk about those. That You can thank Amazon there. You see data centers performing very well. The cell towers performing very well. And at the bottom is malls. As you know, uh, the mall industry has taken a big hit over the past couple of years. And uh, as you can see here from various retail closures, some of the mall companies are having some issues. That's why they lag. Switching to this year, this is this data was taken as of this past weekend. So these are numbers through this past weekend, uh, middle of April. Uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic and everybody being confined to their homes, as you can see, data centers and cell towers have been dominating the performance. Everybody's using their phones more. Everybody's doing Zoom chats or go to WebEx meetings as we're on here. And so thus, these companies are benefiting extremely well. Some examples of data centers would be Digital Realty, DLR, Cyrus One, ticker C-O-N-E, CoreSight, C-O-R, Q-T-S, uh, Cell Towers, there's two, there's two major players out there. It's American Tower, A-M-T, and Crown Castle, C-C-I. And then there's also one more company, it's uh, SBA Communications, ticker S-B-A-C. And then if you look at the performance, obviously you would expect industrial to continue to do well. Amazon rents a lot of space from a lot of the industrial REITs. People are using Amazon and a lot of the warehouse properties for deliveries. So thus you would expect the industrial properties to perform very well. Uh, as you can see then storage, manufactured housing, single family rental, and then all the way to the bottom, unfortunately it's the hotels as we've all seen the Marriott's, Hilton's of the world. Though they're not REITs, you, you've read about them in the headlines, a lot of the trouble that a lot of the hotel companies have been going through the shopping malls, the shopping centers, billboards, outdoor advertising is, uh, to quote our local paper, is dead right now. And so, you know, casinos are all closed. And it's a real shame, but you know, this is, it's just a big shift here over the past, you know, couple of months of looking at performance. And though we expect to obviously come out of this on the other side and take some time to get back, you know, this is, this, these numbers right now are uh, painting a bleak picture, but hopefully this is just a blip in time. If you look at the cumulative returns by property sector over the past 10 years, again, this is from our friends at Hoya, you know, you can just see that manufactured housing has done so well, seeing the growth of retirees moving to say, like Arizona, California, Florida, the manufactured housing guys have done very well. Equity Lifestyles, as I mentioned, ELS is owned by uh, one of the most famous REIT investors that's out there. His name is Sam Zell of um, uh, Equity Properties. Uh, for those that don't know Sam Zell, check him out. He's a very, very famous in our industry. Home builders, self storage, industrial have all performed very well over the past decade. And so it's just really interesting to look at how, how you know, where we're at right now. As we look at the future, everything has gone online. So we look at e-commerce and it's just a huge part of our day-to-day -day lives. Amazon has taken over the world. Industrial REITs have benefited from this. Uh, if you look at the Amazon impact, think about how malls and shopping centers have had to adapt to compete against Amazon. So, uh, you know, they're going towards the uh, experiential experience, whether it's a movie theater, a Starbucks, a gym, a doctor's office. They're trying to figure out a way to capture a consumer from 12 to, you know, a 24 hour day if possible, 
where you go there for your morning coffee, you go work out, you go have lunch, go catch a movie, go hang out with your kids at the playground, something like that. But they've captured you for many, many hours in a given day. How does Amazon really impact the REITs? Think about from a department property with so many Amazon packages that are being delivered. I saw in the past couple of months, I was at a friend's um, apartment property and looking at the Amazon storage locker that's common in many apartment properties now. Uh, grocery stores, you know, have picked up with, especially now in uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, deliveries, grocery deliveries, all the major grocery stores are now doing curbside pickup, door-to-door -door delivery. And as the more that Amazon grows, the more office space, industrial properties, jobs, everything that it's going to create because of their growth. As we talked about with cell towers and data centers, there's also this thing called 5G that's been rolled out. Everybody knows what 5G is and the use of the cloud. So if you look at cell towers and data centers, there's a data point that I love to use. It was uh, mentioned by um, the, C the former CEO of American Tower at a conference a couple of years ago. YouTube, there was 24 hours of uh, video posted every minute on YouTube. That was as of a couple of years ago. And if you think about where all that data is stored, it's on the cloud. Well, now you're thinking about apps like TikTok and some of these other places where there's just so much video content that's being generated. The digital realities of the world, a lot of these data center players are the ones that are benefiting from it. Take it one step further. Let's go global with this. If you think about the emerging countries like in India and Africa and some of these places where they really don't have cell towers, they're not on 4G, 5G technology yet. If AMT or CCI is able to go in and, and place a tower in one of these countries and make it now a um, working economy for so these people are able now to shop online, con conduct business, you know, it's bringing them into the 21st century. And now uh, they just benefit so much incremental growth by these new cell phone companies that would attach to their towers. And are, is there any chance we're going to go backwards? No, we're already talking about 6G. And what's the future going to entail? If you think about how much video content that we watch on our phones, think about the next generation where it's almost, you know, at what point is it going to be real time where it's, you don't see what really looks like a TV show, but it looks like somebody standing right next to you. Another angle to look at, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, we are all getting older. It's a shame. In my opinion, the only major sector that's going to make money off of every single person is the healthcare REITs. Uh, so if you go to the hospital, the doctor's office, a rehab, something like that, the healthcare REITs have a platform in place that they're going to make money off these. So here's all the different types of healthcare facilities. I'm sure you, you guys have seen all these everywhere you go medical office, a rehab, assisted living, hospice care, continuing care living. So there's guys like Ventas, VTR, Medical Properties Trust, MPW, Omega Health, OHI. You know, there's a lot of these companies that are out there that focus exclusively on this brand. And, you know, it's, it's definitely a, a hot topic looking at the senior housing with COVID right now. But again, if you think about the long-term picture, uh, you know, the only person that's undefeated, as they say, is father time. Another angle to look at is cannabis. Uh, Innovative Industrial, ticker IIPR, is the only publicly equity refocus on the cannabis space that was the first mover. You have a couple other guys that have converted to focus on cannabis, like Power Reed PW is making a big push in that place right now. But you think about the future, where could cannabis REITs potentially go? How could these guys benefit by working with other industrial producers? And it's a really interesting story. Also being sharp, a local sharpshooter. One of my, a couple of my favorite companies, there's a, a um, Southern California industrial REIT called Rexford Industrial, ticker REXR. These guys know this area so well and have accumulated so much industrial space in the area that they're the go-to when it comes to SoCal industrial. And so another example is Retail Opportunity, ROIC. Uh, Stuart Tans is the CEO. They own a variety of shopping centers, all uh, mostly in California. They do a lot of their transactions off market. They are approached by local families that own these shopping centers and do a lot of off market deals. And some of these properties, you know, have been in these families for so many years that they just get, they, they're such great deal makers and they know this area so well that you have to respect these companies that, you know, know these areas. Another example is uh, monthly dividends. We talked about how important dividends are. Um, typical dividend yield 
before a lot of this started was in the mid 4% range. So you have guys like Realty Income, Stag Industrial that pay consistent monthly dividends. Realty Income had raised their dividend over 100, I think it was 122 months in a row um, going back every single month. A lot of the guys have cut their dividends in, in the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, some of them have converted some of their dividend payments to stock. It will come back as um, one comment to point out, talking to a lot of analysts and the companies themselves, They've been through hiccups before. Most of these REITs were around in 9-11 and suffered you know, when 9-11 happened, the housing crisis of 2008, 2009. And they've learned from these major crises on how to become a leaner, meaner, better operator. So they diversify their tenant base. They have lower leverage in place. They know how to handle times of diversity and stress. And they come through on the other side, a better company. Let's look at some other ideas. We're gonna talk about ETFs here in a second. There's a lot of options that are out there for REITs. Do your uh, research on them. A lot of them you know, can be illiquid. Uh, REIT preferreds, uh, something I know very well, there's huge demand for REIT preferred stocks because you're getting that incremental yield. You move up in the, in the uh, stack, should there be a bankruptcy situation or a distress uh, as you're paid dividends and you're owed in the capital structure. But REIT preferreds are a very interesting niche to look out. There's a couple of good REIT preferred ETFs that are out there. And um, public storage currently has the lowest yielding REIT preferred stock that's out there. I think it's the coupons like a, a high threes, if I recall. Let's look at ETFs. ETFs are another really interesting sector. Uh, an ETF, the way I describe it, it's a publicly traded mutual, mutual fund. It's a basket of securities comprised of you know, 20, 30, 50, 100 different stocks inside one per one company that you'd be able to buy. Um, unlike mutual funds where they strike the NAV at four o'clock every single day, you can pull up a quote on an ETF, you know where you can buy it, you know where you can sell it. They're updated every, you know, they're updated pretty much by the second. So you were able to trade it as if it's a regular stock. ETFs are rebalanced daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, annually. It just depends. It's all in the prospectus, and they tell you that information. Again, thanks to our friends at Hoya and IRE. We look at some of the fund flows. This is from 2019. $5.3 uh, billion flowed into the um, – excuse me, more than that um, – if you look at all the fund flows, you just see 2018, we had that weakness, but everything had flew back into the market. This is total Vanguard, number one asset drawer, pulling in all the funds. This is just looking at 2019, who is bringing in the most money in the largest size. Uh, we can provide all this data to you after uh, the presentation. Look at the performance. This is, again, as of 2019 data, just for a clarification, the dividend yield. The core U.S. ETFs were yielding 2.8% on the average. Uh, but uh, anywhere up from 22 to 27 percent. If you look at some of the core ETFs that are out there, you've got the housing home builders. We'll talk about a couple of those international, a lot of the individual guys, the mortgage read ETFs, sector and factors. Um, this is year to date read ETF performance. Just taking a, a quick look at what's the best performer out there. No surprise, SRVR. I'm going to talk about that here in a couple of seconds. INDS. Um, VNQ is held well. Again, some of these, this, these are obviously skewed for weakness in the past six weeks that we've had the pandemic. And more, one more interesting thing that you need to focus on is this in the percentage in the top 10, um, what the 10, top 10 holdings represent as a percentage of the overall portfolio. You want, do you want something that's going to pretty much put all your eggs in one basket or do you want something that's diversified? So it's something really interesting to follow. What's the worst performers year to date? You, here's the worst performers, RQI, some of these super dividends, mortgage REITs. Mortgage REITs have been under a lot of pressures we've discussed. So this is just talk, talking about some of the uh, weak performers here. Here's six different thematic REIT ETFs. We will, I will go over them individually. The first one up is INDS, the Pacer Benchmark Industrial Real Estate ETF. I just looked, it's got $45.45 million under management. In 2019, it was up 38.8%, and this year it's down about 13 and a quarter percent. These are its top 10 holdings, Prologis, who just announced their earnings a couple of days ago, Duke Realty, Liberty Property, Monmouth, Stag Industrial, Torino, to name a few, Rexford. They pretty much own all, it's all the publicly traded industrial REIT companies that are out there. Pacer is uh, out of um, Pennsylvania. It's a great company. Uh, Kevin Kelly is the uh, 
index provider, if for those that know who Kevin Kelly is, does a wonderful job and uh, very, very sharp mind. You can see him on Bloomberg CNBC. Another Pacer index is, uh, we talked about server, uh, just crossed the $500 million, or $529 million under management. As you can imagine, they've had a very good year, especially the past few weeks with everybody again uh, in quarantine. So Equinix, American Tower, Crown Castle, Digital Realty, uh, QTS top 10 holdings here, a really good story. Uh, server was up just under 40%, 39.5% in 2019, up 3% this year. This is what I call retail RTL. This is the Pacer retail R, uh, ETF. As you can see, it's composed of some net lease and shopping centers, realty income, Simon Property Group, Regency Centers, National Re Retail, Triple N, uh, Federal Realty. Again, these are the holdings as of middle of January. <clears throat> but um, they just have six. They just crossed six hundred and sixty million dollars under management, ten uh, up ten point six six percent last year. And uh, because of the weakness, what we're seeing right now, down fifty percent this year, year to date. Netlease, Netel. This is a very interesting ETF. It's all Netlease companies, Netlease real estate. These would be what what you'd call the out parcels at shopping centers or in the malls, where you would find gas stations, McDonald's, coffee, Starbucks. Chipotle, your two and three box, uh, you know, properties. Netlease, Netto was started was uh, started by two guys that came from Store Capital. Store Capital ticker STOR is a company that's owned by Berkshire Hathaway. It's part of their, one of their big investors, Warren Buffett. Uh, Chris Volk is the CEO of Store Capital. Two guys, Alexi and Chris, came from Store to start Netto last year. Uh, $33 million under management. It was up 10.29% last year, and it's down about 34% year to date. Again, that's skewed over the past several weeks, but they own all the um, net lease, um, ET, the, the, excuse me, the net lease comp publicly traded companies that are out there. And we could talk more about that if you have any questions. Hoya, uh, they have the Home Builders ETF, the housing ETF. So this could be comprised of the apartment REITs, the Home Builders, some of the home improvement, um, stores. And when I say residential, that does also include some of the senior housing and student housing properties. Uh, Homes has $12 million under management. It was up 16.2% last year, down about 30% this year. And then lastly, this is the newest REIT ETF that's out there. This is the Alps REIT dividend dogs. What they did was they took an existing ETF, converted it, and took nine different REIT sectors pulled the stocks with the with the five highest dividend yields in each sector and came up with this 45 name ETF. Very intriguing idea. And for those that are on the hunt for dividends, this is maybe an interesting way to capture some dividend income. Uh, it's got $30 million, 30.22 million under management, and it's down about the same with its other peers, about 30%, 32% year to date. If you're like me, you like to read, you like to learn about the history, my two favorite books when it comes to REITs, uh, this first one is Watch Out for That Rat Hole and Witness the REIT Revolution by Ken Campbell. Ken is um, a very famous REIT portfolio manager, uh, gives a history about the industry, fantastic read. The godfather of REITs uh, as far as the textbook that's used by many college campuses, individual investors, those that get into the business, he's no longer with us, uh, sadly, Roth Block, but he published Investing in REITs, Real Estate Investment Trust, just a fantastic book. And it's basically REITs 101. I highly recommend if you're learning about the space, that's a book to put on your radar screen. If you want to look online, REIT.com, it's, it's a go-to source. It has great education. Um, it's the voice for the real estate investment trusts. Um, <clears throat> great, great resource to use. And um, for those that want to reach out to me, here's my contact information. My partner in Arizona and I have a, a daily newsletter that we put out uh, covering the REIT space. <clears throat> it covers 170 pu publicly traded REITs, looking at the news headlines, ratings changes uh, from the Wall Street, performance metrics, charts, all the uh, sector performers. We do a little tables with sector performance. We also try to find all the needles in the haystack. Where's the interesting news stories across the country that are moving these companies? And we give you direct links to all these stories that um, hit the tape every single day. It's usually seven to eight pages every single day. We publish a weekly 
REIT index table, COPS talking about all the uh, performance metrics of the REITs that make up the S&P 500, 600, uh, 400, and the Russell 1000 and 2000 indexes, as well as all the REIT ETFs. We get performance metrics, um, AUM updates. So we provide, we try to provide as much data about the industry that we can get out there because we feel like more and more people need to understand what's going on in the world of REITs because when you look at what's paying the highest dividends, what pays the most dividends that are out there, REITs are generally in the first breath with utilities and commodities and some of these other sectors, but REITs are consistently one of the highest dividend paying sectors that are out there. And with that, I'd like to turn it over with any questions that are out there, and I thank you for uh, your time this afternoon. All right, David, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, great having you on here. We did have a few questions that came in. Uh, looks like we have about five minutes. So if you do have some questions, folks, feel free to type those in. We'll get those relayed. Um, question with Texas, specifically the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex area, being a hotbed for companies moving to um, moving in and taking up more and more commercial space. Do you think the REITs will take advantage of COVID possibly driving commercial inventory down in pricing? That's a very interesting question. Uh, I don't know if we have enough time to answer that. I will say based on the past couple of years with all the corporate relocations that we have been seeing into the Dallas-Fort Worth area, the, uh, the pricing has gone up somewhat. Um, like a lot of other cities, you're seeing folks being further and further spread out. Um, I feel that <laughs> life as we know it has changed with COVID and social distancing. Um, I feel like the offices of the future are going to be changing dramatically. But from a location perspective, uh, being in the middle of the country uh, in Dallas, being two, three hours from either coast, it's still going to be a great place to consider to relocate. All right, thank you. Uh, another question, could REITs be a replacement for bonds in one's portfolio? What's the risk? Depending on what kind of bonds you're looking at, if it's government type treasuries, I mean, the chances of default there are, you know, less than 0% because the government will always be sponsor your bonds. I don't, I feel if anything, it should be a complement to your portfolio. It should not replace it. Um, there are companies that are out there, you know, um, a great company that's out there to check out is a company called Safehold. They announced their earnings today, ticker S-A-F-E. They advertise a lot of their portfolio as being almost a bond because of the fact of how long the lease structure is on the, on the they own the ground leases on the properties. So if you look at the structure of a ground lease, potentially over 50 to 100 years, it's almost like a, a bond replacement. But from an actual a sector perspective, no, I do not personally recommend re <coughs> replacing your bond portfolio with REITs. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, question came in. They noticed that some U.S.-based REITs are available in foreign exchanges such as Toronto Stock Exchange, despite their properties are 100% in the U.S. Is there a business rationale and strategy for some of them to do that? Uh, they gave an example, um, REIT ticker SRT.UN. Uh, not familiar with that ticker off the top of my head. Hang on one second. Let me look this up so I can understand. Is that Steadfast? S-R-T-C-N. I'm, I'm thinking about Brookfield because Brookfield's are slate. Okay. I think about Brookfield is a good example. Brookfield's dual listed. Uh, they've got listings here and um, in Canada. There's also a another example is, I believe it's called Prime. Prime is a U.S.-based, excuse me, it's a Singapore REIT that owns U.S. office buildings. So we can invest in it here, but it's, it's, it's available overseas. I think it's Prime. I could be mistaken. What I'm getting at, to, 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 answer, to answer the question, I, I don't know from the actual structure per se. Um, I just think that you're going to start seeing some of these more cross-listings and global listings. I'll give you another quick example. A couple years ago, when I was uh, at another REIT shop, we used to trade Canada, and it was you would trade Rio Can, and uh, which is ticker it was uh, R E I in Canada, and then um, Cap, um, I think it was C A R. But it used to be like if you traded Rio Can, you've traded Canada. You only need to trade the one name to be involved in the country. So um, I, I think that you know, obviously that's that's a question more for. Um, an advisor, an advisor or the company itself? I, I don't know the answer to that question. 
All right, no problem. Um, do you think that mall REITs will ever regain their higher yields? Well, I, th that's a great question. And I, again, I think it's more time I'm being allotted to discuss. I think it depends on location. If you look at a guy like Summit Property Group who owns some of the, you know, the class A malls in this country versus somebody like CBL who may own the one mall in Topeka, Kansas, I think, you know, what's the number one rule of real estate that they've always taught you? Location, location, location. And one of Simon's most, most valuable properties in the entire country is the forum shops in Las Vegas. In the past month, do you think the value of the forum shops has gone down 25 to 50% or more? From where I sit, I don't think so. I think Las Vegas will eventually come back. The tourists will come back. They're gonna go back to the malls eventually. I think they're, you know, these will come back. There is a mall merger on the table still between Simon Property Group and Taubman Centers, TCO, and neither side has given any indication that the deal is going to go away. So I feel like a lot of these guys are, are reinventing themselves. They are putting in new concepts and experiences to continue to draw mall traffic. There's been a great couple of stories out recently with a lot of these companies, mall companies, putting in esports arenas and venues to try to lure millennials and youth back to the mall. And if you look at Twitch and some of these other online platforms of kids and youths watching um, online video games, and if you look at the number of people going to events to watch esports, it could be a wonderful combination for these malls to partner up with these esports arenas to draw traffic and all the other incremental businesses participating in that. All right, uh, we, we did have a few people asking how they can sign up for your newsletter. Sure, if you can um, reach out to me at the email address here on the screen, David Auerbach at weg1.com, W-E-G-1.com. We can talk, I can put you in touch with my partner who handles uh, the newsletter on our behalf, but I'm, 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 I love emails, whether it's 6 a.m., 6 p.m., I'm one of those guys that's always emailing. I'll be happy to respond to you. But my newsletter is because of readers. We're trying to fill in gaps and, and provide information that they're not finding other places. And so if there's, specific, if there's specific information that you're looking for, we are very receptive to it. We wanna to try to help people understand what's going on out there, why are the stocks moving the way that they're moving, and how can we learn more about what's going on in this industry? All right, David, it looks like that put, uh, puts us about time. Uh, we really thank you so much for being here. Great thank presentation. You so for, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And everybody be safe and look forward to seeing you again in person soon.